Uh, and so Dr. Fengroth, he completed his medical doctorate degree at University of British Columbia. And after that, he did his internal medicine residency at U of T and then hematology fellowship at British Columbia again. And he's currently a fellow in the adult bone marrow transplantation at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. He's also the founder and director of the Stem Cell Club, a donor recruitment organization in Canada. And he is also a researcher uh, with the Canadian Donation and Transplantation Research Program. And we love to, uh, we're really happy to have you, Dr. Fengrit. Uh, welcome to U of T again. Uh, and he was, uh, uh, we are really excited to hear about your talk. Thank you so much, uh, Rupal, for that, introduction, for that introduction. Thank you to the department for, for inviting me and for, for hosting uh, this talk on a, a topic that's near and dear to, dear to my heart. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll get started. That, so my talk is titled Addressing Disparities in Access to HLA Matched Unrelated Stem Cell Donors in Canada. A and uh, as Rupal mentioned, um, I, well, I did my undergraduate training at McMaster and then med school at University of British Columbia. And, and then I spent three years in Toronto doing internal medicine. Uh, before going back to Vancouver uh, uh, for a fellowship training in, in hematology at UBC. And right now I'm, I'm, I'm lecturing to you from New York, uh, actually, where I'm doing training as a bone marrow transplant fellow in Manhattan. And, and so I'll start by saying that uh, allogeneic stem cell transplantation is a curative therapy for patients who have high risk or advanced hematologic malignancies, but it requires access to a suitable donor. And my interest has been in uh, the disparities in access to alternative donor allografts, where, where a disparity, a health disparity is a, is a difference in health outcome that's closely linked to social, economic, and environmental disadvantages. And so this talk I'll split into two parts. The first is a primer on stem cell donation from stem cells to saving lives uh, for those uh, in the audience who aren't uh, familiar with this field. Uh, and then the second part of the talk uh, describes the work that I've been doing with Stem Cell Club and recruiters across Canada to augment recruitment of committed volunteer donors from diverse backgrounds to unrelated donor registries. So I'll start with an introduction to stem cell donation, um, which is a therapy that offers hope to patients with an array of blood diseases. And so I'll, I'll, when I talk about stem cell donation in this talk, I'm specifically referring to blood stem cell donation, where blood stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells live in the bone marrow and produce all the different parts of our blood, the red blood cells that carry oxygen and nutrition around, uh, the white blood cells of our immune system, the platelets, which help us to prevent bleeding, they're all made uh, as a result or from the, the stem cells in the bone marrow. Uh, and there are patients who have a variety of diseases which either damage those factories um, uh, or uh, replace those factories or the factories aren't working properly. And so where, you know, there can be a patient who has a blood cancer like leukemia or lymphoma, which is kind of like a weed in the garden that is the bone marrow and, and the weeds overtaking the, the healthy factories and and um, the, there's not being health, healthy blood produced as a result. Um, or patients can have bone marrow failure syndromes where there aren't factories there at all. And that can be like aplastic anemia, or they can have diseases where the factories aren't working quite right. And so, you know, you can have a, a, a patient that's got lots of stem cells in the bone marrow. Um, and like, for example, in myelodysplastic syndrome, and, uh, it, and they're not made, those, those factories aren't working right for that patient. And so with a stem cell transplantation uh, from a, an unrelated donor or from, or from a donor rather, uh, the, the patient's own stem cells are destroyed, the, their own bone marrow is destroyed with chemotherapy and or radiation therapy, and then replaced by a, a donor's stem cells uh, to, to, for that, so that patient's getting new factories, the donor's factories that then inside the patient make the donor's cells, the donor's immune system, the donor's red blood cell making machinery, et cetera. And so, but the, the thing about this kind of a transplant is you've got to pick the right donor. It's got to be a match to the patient. And so what do I mean by that? Well, I like to explain, and I use a lot of analogies when I'm speaking to patients, that um, when you go to the supermarket and when you buy a piece of fruit, uh, you know, an apple or a banana or whatever, you go to the cashier and the cashier scans it 
and the computer knows what it is that you're buying just by scanning the barcode label. Well, so too, all the cells of our body have barcode labels and they're called human leukocyte antigens. They're the cell surface proteins that are responsible for antigen presentation to the immune system. And it's very important that the HLA markers of the donor match those of the patient. Um, and, and so uh, it's, um, most patients, however, do not have a matched donor in their families. And so you can see in the diagram on the right that, you know, if you have mom and dad that have, you know, a set of HLA loci, and we're looking to match uh, uh, eight in particular that are important, A, B, C, and D, R um, on class one and two. Um, and so um, if you see from the example diagram, um, you know, because everyone gets half of their DNA from mom and half from dad, so then there are four different possible combinations of the different HLA loci in the children. And so you can see that in the example on this uh, diagram, the, the, this patient um, has a, a one in four chance to matching to any of his siblings as a full match. And then uh, a one in two chance that he'll be, that, that, that patient will be a half match to any sibling. And then a one in four chance that the patient won't match at all to a particular sibling. Um, now, for patients who don't have a fully matched donor in their family, uh, options include uh, a matched unrelated donor on, the un on, one, on one of the unrelated donor or volunteer donor registries of the world, um, a half-matched family donor, uh, a cord blood donor, and I'll talk about that in a, in more in a moment, um, but, but that relates to uh, Canada's got a public cord blood bank, in the, and there are public cord blood banks in the world where uh, at time of delivery of the baby, um, if the parent is participating the, uh, in, in this program, the uh, baby's um, umbilical cord blood is harvested and then frozen in a cord blood bank, uh, and the stem cells there that uh, can be accessed to help a patient in need. And then there is also the opportunity to do a mismatched unrelated donor transplant, but the transplant physicians would much prefer to do a uh, fully matched sibling donor transplant where available. Um, and if not, they would prefer all else being equal, uh, a fully matched unrelated donor uh, to be available for those patients in need. So now finding a matched unrelated donor, so I already explained that finding a matched donor in the family, most patients do not have one. Um, because there's only one in four chance that you'll match to a sibling. But um, finding a matched unrelated donor is not easy either. And despite there being right now over 38 million people uh, in the world who are registered as potential unrelated donors, still many patients do not have a suitable match. And because people are more likely to find a match within their own ancestor or ancestral group, um, and because the diversity of the donor registry uh, in Canada is lacking, um, particular ethnic racial groups are hit much harder by this problem. I'll talk about that more in more detail in a moment. And there's also a special need for males as donors because uh, uh, studies have shown that when the donor is male, there's less chance of a particular complication called graft versus host disease um, you know, in, uh, in the recipient. And that's a syndrome where the new immune system that the patient receives from the donor um, is attacking the healthy organs uh, uh, from, uh, of the patient. So, I mean, with the transplant, the donor, uh, the patient is getting a new immune system from the donor. Uh, and, and basically, there are, I like to explain that there are two ways that a, a, an allogeneic stem cell transplant works to fight um, a blood cancer, for example. The first way is that, you know, before the patient is going into their transplant, they get really strong chemotherapy, which wipes out their bone marrow, the healthy bone marrow, yes, but also any residual cancer cells that remain after initial therapy had been given to that patient. But also the second way that a transplant works is that the new immune system that the patient gets from the donor is like a circulating police force that goes around and attacks uh, and, 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 and recognizes any cancer cells that might be hiding or that might remain after initial therapy. And that's important because the way that these cancers develop is that they're, you know, they, they're, they're camouflaged to the immune system of the patient. Uh, they're hiding. And, and so their own immune system wasn't recognizing it as a problem and attacking it. And that's what allowed the cancer or, or disease to grow in the first place, in, in most cases, in, in many, many diseases for which patients get a transplant. But uh, the corollary to this uh, 
uh, new immune system fighting the cancer is that the new immune system can fight the patient also. And that's related to the, the match between the patient and the donor. And so, you know, the, the more the mismatch, the higher the risk of this complication graft versus host disease. But also uh, in the case of uh, the sex of the donor, um, there's a, a higher rate, uh, there seems to be a higher rate of graft versus host disease uh, when the donor is female compared to the, when the donor is male. And that may relate also to the uh, parity, the, the history of pregnancy uh, in, the fem in the female donors, where there have been studies that specifically separated out um, that, you know, uh, when the donor is female and has a history of multiple pregnancies, um, that confers the highest risk uh, or a much higher risk of graft versus host disease in the recipients of those stem cells. So I, I want to explain a little bit about how stem cells are donated. So there are two main ways that an adult uh, related or unrelated donor can donate their stem cells, their blood stem cells. The first is in a process that's very much like blood donation. Um, so first, the donor will get a growth factor called granulocyte colony stimulating factor. Injections of that for about five days um, under their skin and in their belly, for example. And that will mobilize or move their stem cells from their bone marrow into their bloodstream. And, and, and following that, uh, the donor comes in uh, and you can see they're sitting in sort of a chair here and uh, blood is taken from one arm and it's filtered through an apheresis machine. This is the same machine that's used actually with, uh, for a variety of purposes, including to, uh, for platelet donation, for example. And it separates the stem cells that had been mobilized from the bone marrow into the bloodstream. And, and they're collected in a, in a separate bag. And then the remainder of the blood actually is then collected and returned back to that patient. And so the patient, or the donor, I mean, so the, the donor is, is sitting in the chair here for about four to six hours and their blood is being cycled through the apheresis machine. Uh, and, you know, the donor's reading a book or watching a movie or what have you. And then at the end of the four to six hour period uh, leaves and, and goes home. And those stem cells then uh, go on to save, uh, potentially save a patient's life. Um, and, and it's also, it's a patient for whom there may not have been any other matches anywhere in the world. Um, the, the, the second and, and less common way that stem cells are donated is directly from bone marrow collection. This procedure is where the donor is put uh, to sleep under general anesthetic, and so they don't uh, feel anything during the procedure. And then uh, a needle is, is used to uh, withdraw uh, bone marrow from the side of the hip, uh, the iliac crest. Uh, and again, this is done less than 10% of the time. Uh, majority of the time, stem cells from adult donors are, are collected uh, from peripheral blood. So um, that was my just introductory primer to sort of explain the principles of stem cell donation, which become uh, irrelevant in my talk. But, but I'll go into a bit more detail now about the work that I've done to, first of all, about the problem related to disparity in access to unrelated stem cell donors, but also the work that I've, I've been doing with Stem Cell Club to address that problem. So I'll explain that minority patients, as I, as I mentioned earlier, have a markedly decreased likelihood of identifying a fully matched unrelated donor. And when I say fully matched, I mean matched at all eight of the relevant HLA loci that we're looking at. And this is data from my center, Sloan Kettering in the United States, um, looking at uh, uh, patients from 2005 to 2017. Uh, and, and you can see that uh, Southern and non-European patients uh, had a less than 50% likelihood of securing a matched unrelated donor. That's been improving over time. So whereas you can see the light blue versus the dark blue, light blue would be from 2005 to 2011. And then the dark blue, a little bit more recent from 2012 to 2017, there's a slight uptick in the, in, for each ethnic racial group and the likelihood that they'll find that they'll have a matched unrelated donor. Um, but it's still uh, for the majority uh, that are non uh, nor Northwest European in ancestry, um, they have a very tough time finding a match. And this is similar to data that's been reported by, say, Gregor et al. from New England Journal in 2014, which showed that match rates for specific uh, Black peoples, a Central, uh, uh, Central American uh, uh, origin or ancestry or, or, or Black people of, of African or, uh, ancestry, uh, you know, 16 to 20% match rates or, or uh, chance of finding a match for a stem cell transplant from an unrelated donor as compared to 75% or higher for, for patients of Northwest European ancestry, a market disparity here. And I explained that there's a, there's a number of reasons contributing to this disparity. So first of all, uh, 
you can see on the top right, this is Canada's registry specifically, the, break, the ethnic breakdown on Canada's registry. You can see that the majority of donors listed on our registry, over 400,000 donors on this registry are white, are Caucasian and ancestry. I mean, Canada, the majority of people in Canada are Caucasian, but still this is not proportionate where, you know, black people here let, make up less than 1% of, uh, less than 1.4% of the donors on Canada's donor registry, whereas black people in Canada are over 3%. And you can do that for all, so, for a range of ethnic racial groups, you know, uh, indigenous peoples make up, uh, well, First Nations people specifically make up 1% of the registry, despite making up uh, several percent of Canada's population, et cetera. But, but the problem is actually greater than that because the majority of countries in the world that have stem cell registries are Western countries where the majority of people in those countries are Caucasian. And, and so even though in countries like Canada and the countries like in, in, in the US and the UK, et cetera, uh, there may not be proportionate representation of minority or, or diverse ethnic groups on those registries. But even if there was, there'd still be a huge problem in that the majority of countries that have these databases in the first place are, are, are dominated by Caucasian peoples. And, you know, Africa, for example, there's only one registry in all of Africa and South America. I mean, Africa has a lot of health uh, issues and problems related to their healthcare system, et cetera. And this is a small problem compared to the, the greater problems that that continent faces with respect to healthcare and, 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 and struggles and so on. But, but for the patients, uh, in need of a transplant, who are from those demographic groups, they don't have access to the diversity of HLA markers, um, which are more, and people are more likely to find a match from within their own ancestral group because of the genetics. And, and so um, it's very, it's very difficult from that, from that perspective. India, for example, has over a billion people and uh, they have a registry there with a, a couple hundred thousand people on it. I mean, there are 38 million people who are registered as potential stem cell donors and only a couple hundred thousand are from, from India. And so it's, it's an example of, of the fact that uh, non-Caucasian peoples or, or non-Northwest European peoples are not well represented on the registries of the world. But, but there are a range of other reasons contributing to this or factors contributing to this disparity as well. So uh, different ancestral groups will have different diversity, uh, di different degrees of HLE diversity. And so, uh, you, and so you can see in this diagram on the bottom right, this is a, a seminal uh, paper uh, from Bayday et al. from 1995. This group modeled, okay, what would our, what would the US registry uh, look like if we only recruited, uh, if it was made up of only African-American peoples and we only recruited additional African-American peoples to the registry as compared to if it was only made up of Caucasian peoples and we only recruited Caucasian peoples to the registry. And you can see that's the top versus the bottom lines in this graph. And the, and the, uh, the x-axis is the number of donors that's recruited and the y-axis is the proportion of new alleles that's recruit that are, that are, 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 are secured or, or, or added to the registry, the number of new combination, combinations of HLA markers that are added to the registry. And you can see that, so for, for African-American peoples, they have a greater degree of HLA diversity such that, um, even if you add, a th if you add a thousand new African uh, American peoples versus a thousand new Caucasian peoples to a registry, you're going to get more diversity of HLA types from the African American peoples, for example. And that makes it harder for any ind individual African person or person of African heritage to find a matching stem cell donor, even if the numbers were equal and they're not in terms of the representation of those people on the registry. Uh, there are additional problems, however, and, and one of those problems relates to attrition. And so attrition is defined as for those people who are listed as potential stem cell donors, if they're called and found to be a match, do they go through with their donation or not? And for many, um, for, so um, in many cases, you know, people are called and they say, you know, I, I can't donate because of, because of a health reason because, or I'm, I, you know, because I, uh, I have a work reason, I'm not able to, to I have exams and other things. So there are a lot of reasons why people may not be able to take off time to, to go through with the donation process. Um, but studies have shown, and these are studies uh, done, uh, I cited one that was done in, in, in um, the UK, but there are similar data uh, in other parts of the world, including the US, that there are higher attrition among minority groups uh, compared to uh, donors who are white of Northwest European ancestry. And there are many reasons contributing to that. And there's research that's looked into that as well. There may be uh, a range of barriers that specific ethnic racial groups face 
with respect to donation, uh, including socioeconomic barriers. I mean, it's hard to sort of go through with a stem cell donation, for example, to help uh, someone in need you can't get food on the table for your children. So, I mean, that's one example, but there are also cultural and religious barriers to overcome and awareness barriers to overcome as well. So, you know, moved by these, this, this issue of disparity in, in access uh, and, and by the stories of patients who couldn't find a match and, and, and particularly those from ethnic racial minority groups, I founded Stem Cell Club back in 2011 uh, at University of British Columbia as a first year medical student. And, and this is a donor recruitment organization that, that, that now has teams at 27 university campuses across Canada. So after the model was very successful in terms of donor recruitment uh, in Vancouver, I expanded to uh, Ontario, including the University of Toronto uh, back in 2015, uh, ha having expanded across British Columbia as a medical student, and then to the provinces across Canada. And we, right before the pandemic, hit, uh, we were recruiting over 5,000 donors per year, all of them young, uh, over 50% male and the majority non-Caucasian as well. And actually we also looked at, back at, at 13,000 donors that we signed up. We've signed up over 20,000 to date, uh, 22,000 actually to date. And uh, with the median follow-up of two years, uh, nine of those donors uh, had gone on to donate their stem cells to an unrelated patient. Now, in order to facilitate the expansion of Stem Cell Club, I developed a training program and infrastructure to facilitate donor recruitment. Uh, the training program includes four modules, six videos, and a workshop. Uh, it's a spiral curriculum where someone comes to do this training program with no prior knowledge of stem cell donation whatsoever, and they learn how to be useful as a volunteer, and then how to lead a drive, and how to organize one, and then how to run a stem cell club chapter. Uh, and the uh, curriculum is regularly revised. It's available on our website, stemcellclub.ca, and we've trained over 1,800 recruiters uh, through this platform. Um, we've also developed checklists to ensure that our drives are standardized across Canada. And this is work that I recently, um, that uh, one of my team members, uh, Angela Chen uh, from uh, University of Waterloo, uh, recently presented at uh, American Society of Transplantation Cell Therapy Conference, uh, evaluating our checklists and showing that they help to reduce the number of errors that happen at drives. Whereas uh, the in the previous, and so from 2011 to 2016, compared to 2016, 2019, um, Stem Cell Club rapidly expanded uh, as we rolled out chapters across Canada, but the er number of errors actually, the proportion of errors went down, the number of errors went down, um, and that was the result of these checklists. Uh, and uh, we continue to focus on recruitment of the most needed demographic groups, young males from a diversity of ethnic backgrounds during a period of time when we tripled our recruitment. Uh, and I think the checklist played a big part in that as well. So I'm gonna outline a number of resources now that we've designed with Stem Cell Club to specifically augment recruitment of ethnic and racially diverse people, minority uh, people from ethnic racial minority groups um, as stem cell donors. And the first I'll, I'll share with you are these diagrams that we developed uh, featuring ethnically uh, diverse donors. Uh, and so this diagram features people, um, donor, a donor of, of African heritage, but we have a range of other uh, diagrams, similar diagrams featuring South Asian, Southeast Asian and ind indigenous males on our website. And I think it's really important that I mean, I didn't invent, uh, and these diagrams didn't invent the process and the, and the, but I think with the communication, it's very key that when someone's signing up, that they see themselves in the potential donor that they're being asked to be in terms of the, the diagram and the marketing. And I, I think that's really key. Um, and so I think these diagrams do make a big deal helping with that. Uh, in 2017, uh, I developed with uh, Elena Kum, who's a recruiter with Stem Cell Club and a recent graduate from Western University, uh, a community of practice to support stem cell donor recruitment in Canada. So a community of, of practice is a group of people who come together and they share a passion or concern for something that they do. And they, and they interact regularly to address that passion and improve uh, on their skills and to discuss problems that they face and work together to address them. And so we set up this community of practice on Facebook uh, it's a Facebook group. We had regular e-meetings uh, of the community and we invited stakeholders in stem cell donor recruitment across Canada to participate. Um, actually, at this point, we have over 400 participants in the stem cell group. Majority are recruiters. Uh, we have some donor registry staff with Canadian Blood Services and Hema Quebec as participants as well, and a number of patients and donors participating. 
We have had eight meetings to date with over 120 attendees nationally. And we have subcommittees that um, the community uh, has, uh, that have formed as a result of this community, focusing on running national campaigns, engaging the media, and developing an array of resources to support recruitment of minority groups as stem cell donors. And so here's an example of some of the meetings that we'd, we've run, uh, running, ethnically, uh, running larger drives, recruiting ethnically diverse stem cell donors, reviewing drive outcomes and identifying strategies to improve how to reduce donor attrition and how to leverage social media to support online donor recruitment. And, and you know, posts to the Stem Cell Club Facebook group range from the sharing of stories, the sharing of resources uh, of stem cell drive outcomes and updates related to donor recruitment. We run a, a series of national campaigns uh, the, the communities come together to run a series of national campaigns, uh, very successful with a, a wide array of media coverage, including Toronto Star and Toronto Sun and over 20 print and, and online media, uh, print and broadcast media uh, covering our, our donor recruitment events, uh, where the, the majority of donors recruited are, are male and, and non-Caucasian. And you can see that, that the community uh, before the launch of this community practice and after, the number of registrants that we recruited, but also the proportion that were male and non-Caucasian increased as a result of the community coming to, together and sharing skills uh, and, and reinforcing with each other the, the mission that we were on, um, keeping each other accountable and on task. The community itself developed an array of resources to support donor recruitment, including uh, a number of infographics that help explain uh, to potential donors uh, the uh, principles of stem cell donation and, you know, and how they can sign up as donors online or in person. We developed a whiteboard video series to support stem cell donor recruitment. And so whiteboard video series is, um, it's, it's a video where the narrator is narrating and then there's an artist that's drawing on a whiteboard to emphasize or to capture what is being discussed in the video. And so this whiteboard video series, it's, it's a series of short videos which outline uh, what is stem cell donation, how does the matching process work, how do I register as a donor, and we actually, we surveyed, we recruited and then surveyed 38 potential stem cell donors from a range of ethnic backgrounds, and we found that watching this video significantly improved both knowledge and attitudes towards donation. We developed this library of stories in stem cell donation called Why We Swab. And, and, and the, the principle here was that um, we felt that we, we, had, we felt that we know that storytelling is an important tool to convey information. And we hypothesized that a library of stories in stem cell donation could help support the education and recruitment of committed stem cell donors. And so um, we launched the story library where we interview patients and donors uh, and stem cell recipients uh, and, and their family members. Uh, we tell their stories in the first person narrative paired with uh, photo or video from them and optimized for publication on social media. And our channels are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And um, to date, we have 102 posts. Uh, with, uh, this is, we launched this program, Why We Swab, about a year and a half ago. We have 102 social media posts, 19 story arcs from over 35 storytellers from a diversity of backgrounds. Our stories have reached over 300,000 people on social media and have been picked up by a number of media outlets. And again, similarly to with the whiteboard video, we showed an array of these social media posts to potential stem cell donors from a diverse ethnic backgrounds. And these stories, not surprisingly, significantly improved the attitudes towards donation. Uh, of those demog of those cohorts, and I, I, this work um, I, I did it in conjunction with the uh, recruiter Gabrielle Jag Jag Jagalava Kuti, who runs Why We Swab. Now, when the pandemic hit Canada, I mean, all of life was interrupted for everyone, but stem cell donor recruitment was no exception. All stem cell drives across Canada were suspended, and so it became important to reinforce or to to rethink how we were going to. Uh, adapt to the pandemic and recruit donors. And I'm very pleased with uh, how we uh, entered onto TikTok. And so for those of you who may be aware, TikTok is a social media platform where people either lip sync um, to existing content or they sort of dance and, 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 and TikTok emphasizes short videos, sort of less than 30 seconds, but even shorter than that can be very successful, highly engaging content. And so we've embraced TikTok and we've got a number of stem cell uh, 
channels. And actually, I'll share with you just a couple of TikToks as an example of some of the work that we've been doing. I'll show one more. So this is more like awareness and catching people's attention, um, but this one's more educational. Still hilarious, though. <laughs> So, I mean, this TikTok explains about granulose so GCSF and how it helps to uh, boost stem cell counts from bone marrow into bloodstream, but in a, in a very engaging way that appeals to our ideal donor demographic. We also have TikToks that are more serious about patient campaigns. So we have over 80 TikToks, and this is the channel that we just launched recently. So, I, you know, I, I, and they've had significant impact, and have been a number have been republished by media in Canada. And so, I think it speaks to the power of of embracing new forms of technology. I mean, this is an example of innovation as a result of the pandemic. That uh, you know, I'm so pleased that I mean, the pandemic was awful, but I'm so pleased that we did this because when the pandemic ends and Gosh, it's going to end at some point. Um, you know, we're going to continue to use TikTok to engage with our target demographic, and we'll have developed an array of skills that we didn't have before. Um, now, I'm quite, I'm very happy with the work that we've been doing with running national campaigns. I explained earlier that the community of practice has come together uh, to run national campaigns, which puts with significant impact. And this year, for the first time, we've started running more focused national campaigns to engage specific demographics of donors. Um, and so this is an example of a campaign that we ran this past Black History Month, uh, hashtag Black Donors Save Lives. An array of content was developed both by and in collaboration with um, Black Canadians across Canada, actually. The campaign was led by um, Sylvia Okonafua, who's a recruiter with Stem Cell Club and a recent graduate from University of Regina in Saskatchewan. And you can see, I mean, Sylvia herself made a video uh, and then, uh, you know, our campaign includes an, uh, an array of TikToks, why we swab stories, infographics, all both developed by and, 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 to, and specifically addressing the need for Black peoples, of uh, uh, Black African, Black Caribbean peoples to, to register as stem cell donors. Uh, it's the first time we ran such a campaign and we plan to run many more ahead like this, uh, both uh, for black people, but for other ethnic racial groups as well. And upcoming, so I mean, I'll, I'll tell you about a pilot campaign that we've run over the past years uh, to engage gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men as stem cell donors in Canada. And the rationale for this campaign is that in Canada, men who have sex with men are deferred from donating blood if they've had sex with another man for the past three months. And that's a long story, and it's hard to get into that details of that in, in a short while. But the relevant uh, aspect to stem cell donation here is that since 2009, this demographic, uh, men who have sex with men, have been eligible to register as stem cell donors, although many men who have sex with men remain unaware of their eligibility uh, in large part because of the rules related to blood donation and not understanding that it's a separate program with different rules. And so we hypothesize that targeted recruitment of this demographic could augment efforts to recruit the most needed stem cell donors and support a more inclusive registry. And so uh, over the past uh, three years, we've run an array of stem cell drives, uh, recruitment events, swabbing events at pride events across Canada. Uh, our recruiters uh, who were running these events received training, uh, were coached to answer questions related to blood and stem cell donation for this demographic, and were, were taught to share the story of William Ashby Hall, who's a gay stem cell donor, donated uh, to and saved the life of a Canadian patient in Montreal, and, and she's shown in the bottom left. And, and in, in these drives that we've run, we've recruited over 350 people as stem cell donors who are, who are men who have sex with men, uh, well, majority, or about 40% were male, majority of whom were men who have sex with men, gay men, bisexual men, queer men, et cetera. Um, and we've also partnered with 
uh, queer performers across Canada to make an array of multimedia that we will launch this coming uh, June as part of a national campaign to engage uh, men of, uh, gay, bisexual, queer, and other men who have sex with men as potential stem cell donors. And, and, and I think that this work, um, I mean, it builds a more inclusive registry, but it also it accesses a population of diverse, uh, or potential population of diverse peoples who wouldn't necessarily have known other eligibility register as donors. And so, I mean, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of benefits to running this kind of a campaign and I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, I'll, I'll end my talk with just some sort of broader uh, comments about how the fact that, you know, and, and I, show, I, show, I showed this data earlier in my talk that despite additional recruitment over time, I mean, the, the, the match rates for across the board are slowly improving, but, but for certain ethnic groups, you know, uh, not fast enough. And I mean, you can look in the diagram on the right, how, you know, in the, in the later time period, that's the dark blue, um, and that's this part over here, you know, the, for African peoples, it's still less than 25% were able to find a match. I mean, that's, that's abysmal. It's terrible for those patients that can't find a match. I mean, there are other options. And, and I think, you know, that this work uh, is showing that uh, other donor options are becoming increasingly important because we can't necessarily registry our way uh, out of the problems related to the, the, the fact that the majority of the donors in the Western world are Caucasian and the majority of uh, registries are in the Western world, et cetera, and the fact that there are genetic differences between ancestral groups that are, are difficult to overcome. And, and so I think that you know, while the, the improvements continue, it's not necessarily going to be possible to just sort of recruit the world to solve this problem, um, at least not in the short term. And, and it sort of uh, drives home the point that other donor options are, are becoming increasingly important. And, and I'll talk with you a bit, a, bit, a bit about that. It's hard to explain the details of cord blood transplantation and, and haploidentical or half match donation uh, in this talk, but there are different kinds of transplants. They're done with different kinds of immune suppression, immune suppression uh, platforms. And the, but the, the outcomes can be comparable. And I mean, the data is still early, but um, with respect to cord blood transplantation, this is data from our center on the left. Uh, and you can see that the three year transplant related mortality is 15%, the overall survival 82% and disease free survival 76% at three years. And, and that's comparable, although this isn't a direct comparison in the graph, it's just outcomes of 90 cord blood transplant patients, but it's, it's a comparable outcome. It's a good outcome compared to uh, match sibling, match unrelated donor transplants. And if you look on the right, you can see a comparison of haploidentical or half match transplants compared to transplants using match sibling donors with again, uh, overlapping essentially outcomes and survival, leukemia for survival, um, up, up, uh, a, a relapse out to three years. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done here, but, but I think um, the bottom line is that these other donor sources, while maybe not preferred and they may have their own issues, they are acceptable options for patients who don't have a match. But the, 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 the question remains, how are these alternative donor sources addressing the racial disparities in access? And so I'll show you here that this is again data from Sloan Kettering showing that um, and the different colors represent the different kinds of donors that are available to different patients of different ancestral groups. And so you can see that while you know, the blue, dark blue is the uh, fully matched eight out of eight unrelated donor transplants. Um, and then light blue is uh, seven out of eight or mismatched unrelated donor transplants. And red is cord blood transplantation. Um, still there are donors, uh, still there are patients without any donor at all. Um, and um, that, that would be the group in, in yellow. Uh, and the majority that don't have any donor at all of, of among these options were, you know, non-European non and particularly patients of African ancestry had a very tough time uh, with many majority of patients who couldn't find a match at all being of African ancestry. And so within specific groups that were able to find say a cord blood match, for example, a cord blood unit, that's a good, a, a good fit for them. Uh, data is also uh, from our center also shows that Europeans have tend to have better graphs that are quality graphs. Again, it's beyond the scope of this presentation for me to outline in detail how to select a cord blood graft for a patient. But suffice it to say that you're looking for uh, a unit that has as high a possible a dose of stem cells because there's a maximum number of cells that can be collected from uh, a cord blood unit at time of the delivery of the baby uh, and the placenta. And, and um, so you can't, I mean, there's a maximum number of cells that get frozen. 
And the, the more cells that you have in the sample, the better. And also the higher the degree of HLA match between the cord blood unit and the patient, the better. But units that were selected for non-Europeans at our center tended to have a, a lower uh, stem cell content and a greater degree of HLA mismatch. And so while cord blood is extending access, still there may be disparity even in the quality of the cord blood units that are selected. And there's a similar problem here with the half matched donor access um, where uh, non-European patients needed a greater number of ha potential half matched donors uh, per patient to, to secure a suitable graft. And so that means that, you know, for a patient of a, non of a non European ancestry, um, they may have had say five siblings and maybe all of them had to be worked up for one suitable half match donor to be found. Whereas for European patients, maybe just three siblings had to be worked up to find one that's willing and suitable to go through with the donation. And that's relevant because you know time is money when you're looking for, if you're a patient in need of a transplant, uh, you know, there can't be delays, long delays related to the workup of multiple donors or potential donors to find that donor that's needed. And also um, in this graph uh, table, rather, you can see that the majority of African patients did not have a half match donor available to them. And that's the same group actually that didn't have um, as good uh, access to cord blood and has market disparity in access to match unrelated donors. And so while these alternative donor sources are extending access, there's still a lot more work to be done. The final thing I'll mention is that we can do, and this is an emerging platform, mismatched unrelated donor transplants where, uh, and so this is a, a study that was recently presented at American Society of Hematology as an oral presentation this past December, where the National Marrow Donor Program did a study, a phase two study, looking at uh, bone marrow uh, donors, uh, mis uh, mismatched unrelated donors that uh, were donating bone marrow um, with um, a particular kind of immunosuppression called post transplants like lobosphamide for patients with blood cancers without a fully matched donor available to them. And uh, this group of uh, donors were sort of four to seven out of eight HLA matched. And you can see the outcomes on the right that the outcomes were acceptable uh, compared to a, an array of controls that were set up um, from a, a big database of, of transplant patients. The overall survival of this cohort um, at one year was 76%. And again, this is a very early study, but um, the, the reason I bring this up is because if mismatch unrelated donor transplants become acceptable, then this has potential again to dramatically extend access for patients who don't have a fully matched unrelated donor. And it increases the relevance of the unrelated donor registries of the world. I'll summarize this, this part of the talk that um, working with recruiters across Canada with Stem Cell Club have developed an array of resources that augment recruitment of committed unrelated donors from diverse backgrounds. The, the training and infrastructure that I outlined at the beginning, the national campaigns and the media engagement that we've had, the multimedia we've developed across an array of channels, uh, you know, inf infographics, TikToks, whiteboard videos, and the storytelling that we've done through Why We Swab. I mentioned that the relevance of our work in recruiting unrelated donors, uh, I mean, it's important and it will continue to increase, particularly if, if mismatch unrelated donor transplants uh, pick up as a mainstream alternative transplant strategy. And we have a number of ongoing objectives, including uh, transitioning uh, more thoroughly to support virtual donor recruitment during the COVID-19 pandemic, improving on donor attrition rates in Canada, continuing to run and expand on our efforts to engage specific ethnic groups nationally as, as donors, uh, ethnic racial groups, and, and then to collaborate with donor registries around the world on these strategies. And I, I want to acknowledge both my mentor at Sloan Kettering and, and, the, and the team there. I work with my, uh, my colleagues at Canadian Blood Services and, and the community of practice leaders uh, uh, with Stem Cell Club and with Bobby Swab and our meet multimedia development team and, and my funding support as well from Canadian Blood Services. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fringit. That was a really uh, good talk. Um, anyone has any questions? Uh, we uh, It's almost five, but maybe we can take one question, one or two. If you just want to unmute yourself and ask a question, uh, that's fine as well. If not, maybe you can put it in the chat. Uh, right, uh, you raise your hand. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to say thank you for the, the amazing and informative talk. Um, I really learned a lot um, where I, I wish I knew more earlier on. Um, but uh, I actually, I have two questions. I'll try and make them quick. 
Um, uh, one was uh, if you knew if there was any studies that were current studies that were looking into CRISPR-Cas9 that might be able to change HLA allele expression um, so that you wouldn't necessarily have to have stem cells from donors um, that are um, uh, from the same ethnicity as the patient. Patient, do you know? If, do you know of anything like that is currently in the works potentially? So my, uh, it's a good question. My first comment is that we don't match donor and patient specifically based on ethnicity or race. We're matching them based on the HLA markers, um, which are more likely to be found. Uh, the allele frequencies are such that you're more likely to find a fully matched donor from within your own ancestral group but that isn't always the case. And I mean, on why we swab, we're working right now on a story that's not yet been published, for example, where there's a Korean man, uh, a patient, and then he goes through with an unrelated stem cell uh, transplant uh, from an unrelated donor, and then goes on to meet his donor two years later. And you can, I mean, it's an on anonymous process, but if the donor and recipient agree to meet, then they can one to two years after the, the process. And, and his donor is Polish. And so it's like, how did that happen? It's like, well, I mean, it's just probability, right? What are the probability of allele frequencies? And so, you know, sometimes it really surprises you. Um, but so we don't, we don't match by race or ethnicity. But your, your question about CRISPR-Cas9, I mean, it's an emerging technology. I'm not aware off by heart of any clinical applications right now. I think that, it, you know, to bring a new technology into the clinic, it takes like 20 years from like conception to, and the reason it takes so long is you can't just prove that it works. You need data. You need data like um, at every step, right? First in animals and then in higher animals. And then you need to bring that data into, into the clinical practice and it becomes a phase one trial. And at the point of phase one trial, I mean, I mean things fall, fail at every point for a whole range, array of reasons, but it's a very long process. And so, you know, I think just in general, the CRISPR-Cas9, like it's coming and it's extremely useful. Uh, I mean, it already won the Nobel Prize and well-deserved it. But I think it's gonna be quite some time before there are an array of clinical applications from CRISPR-Cas9 related technology, because, you know, the theoretical framework, great. And the fact that it works in the lab, great. But then um, not only does it work in patients, but like following patients over time, um, like for it to become standard of care to include, like, I think it just, it, 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 it will just take a lot of time. So, so, and then I guess um, the sort of holy grail would be to not have to do a transplant in the first place, actually. If we're going to sort of have a wish list, let's say, of things that I would want. I mean, a trans I'm a transplanter. I'm going to no, transplant. Oh, sorry. I, I, my, my, my point there is that, um, you know, transplant is very toxic. It's got a, you know, a certain percentage of patients die from the transplant, a certain patients, proportion of patients relapse after the transplant. Um, and a certain proportion of patients, they, they get through the transplant, they're cured of their disease, but they get complications like graft versus host disease, which impact on their quality of life. And I mean, the goal of the transplant is to return a patient to health. Um, and the majority of transplants that, I mean, transplants wouldn't, wouldn't be offered to the patient if that isn't the realistic goal of the transplant, or, or if their options were such that the transplant isn't the best option available to the patient. But I mean, the, the holy grail here, if we can do, if we can develop uh, therapies, um, CRISPR-Cas9 based or, or whatever therapies that can cure the disease without such an intensive therapy, I'm all for it. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done for sure. Awesome, thank, thank you for uh, answering my question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frankert. Uh, anyone has any more questions? Loyola just uh, told me that the section is booked until 5.15. If you have any question, uh, go ahead, you can ask. If not, I will just ask a quick short question to Dr. Frankert. Uh, of course, this is a really good talk and we need to raise awareness uh, about the racial disparity. Uh, however, when it comes to donation, uh, most Question, the very common question people have is, uh, what if I become sick by donation? Uh, what is your answer for that? I mean, uh, stem cell donation is very safe. So I didn't get into the details of stem cell donation safety from that perspective, but donors are always, um, they have to be cleared by a, an independent physician before they can go through with donation. So when we think about safety of donation, we think about the safety of the donor from the, with respect to the patient, they can't have any communicable blood diseases or infectious diseases that would impact on the patient, but they also have to be safe to donate just so they can go through the donation process safely without 
um, encountering an adverse event. And so, you know, the, you know, the, do they have heart problems? Do they have lung problems? Do they have autoimmune disease? Do they have um, a medical condition that would make them to be higher risk, for example, if they were to be uh, needing to donate bone marrow, for example, to get general anesthetic that, you know, if they have a condition where they're like, for example, malignant hyperthermia or, or if they have some problem or history of, of uh, or family history of problems related to um, anesthetic, uh, that's relevant. And so the, the transplant physician evaluates patients or potential donors for their own safety. And it's a separate physician. It's not one that's involved in the care of that particular patient. And so the, the donor has to be cleared by the physician. This is a very safe process. The uh, majority of uh, the, um, with respect to blood stem flow donation, it's a process that's very much like regular blood donation. I mean, everything in life has risk, you know, crossing the street, flying a plane, everything in life has risk. Stem cell donation is very low risk. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the growth factor that potential donors get, the GCSF, um, it's, it's associated with flu-like symptoms and also with pain or ache in the bone that, it, um, and that's sort of how you know that the drug is working because it's moving the stem cells from the bone marrow into the bloodstream. Um, this is temporary and it can be treated with Tylenol. And I mean, so, I mean, donating stem cells from blood is, is not nothing, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a very reasonable ask for what is the benefit for the, for the patient. I mean, it's an act of altruism to donate, but it's an act of heroism also, I mean, um, you're giving up time. Uh, you have to go in and you know sit in the machine for six to eight hours. And I mean, like you can sort of roll, roll your eyes at that. But on the other hand, like it's not nothing. You know, you're giving up a whole day to have someone that you don't even know, um, and you're going through what's probably most likely mild discomfort. Uh, you know, related to the procedure. And I mean, um, we ask. You know, it's important that donors are informed about this process. That it's not a surprise. With respect to stem cell donation from bone marrow, I mean, it's, it's more intensive because it's a procedure that's done under, under general anesthetic and general anesthetic has a risk of sort of one in 100,000 of something going wrong. Um, an allergy, for example, a severe allergic reaction to general anesthetic. I mean, that's the, that's the highest risk of, of anything related to stem cell donation for the donor. I mean, it's one in 100,000, it's, it's not zero, um, but it's still pretty low. And I mean, recovery time from bone marrow donation um, is generally about uh, two to three weeks uh, is the median point where you're fully recovered uh, for most young donors. Uh, so, you know, there are stories and, and we tell some stories on our channel Why We Swab where the, you know, the, there is one stem cell donor uh, that donated bone marrow uh, who was playing lacrosse the next day, for example. And it's not everyone though. Some people are, are having mild discomfort after that procedure comparable to having fallen on ice and it's temporary and it, and it goes away for the vast majority of patients quite quickly within a couple of weeks. And so, you know, again, it's, it's not nothing, uh, but it's, 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 it's very safe overall. And certainly from a long-term perspective, very safe, very low risk. Um, and, and you have the opportunity to save a life that, that no one else could potentially. So it's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Of course, uh, you are saving someone else's life with a little bit of pain uh, that is worth it. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Flingwood. Uh, I guess uh, I don't see any question in the chat. Okay. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for joining the seminar today. And again, I would love to uh, thank Dr. Flingwood for giving us a really good talk and raising words. Thank you. Thank you for having me again.